Okay, so we have two speakers today. So the first of these is Dr. Georgina Georgie Humphreys. <laughs> Georgie is not her middle name, but I'm going to call her Georgie today. <laughs> um, so Georgie is part of the open research team at Wellcome, where she leads on clinical trial transparency and data sharing. So in her talk today, she'll be addressing the question of whether or not good data practices represent good value for money from the funder's perspective. Our second speaker today will be uh, Dr. Katriona McCallum, who is Director of Open Science at Hindawi and also has 20 work, 21 years of experience working in scholarly publishing. So she's previously worked for organisations such as PLOS. And in her talk, Katrina will be providing us with a broad perspective of the data sharing landscape and we'll also touch upon ties between data practices and research culture. So I just wanted to say, first of all, unfortunately, Katrina's Wi-Fi access dropped out today, possibly for the next day or two. So she is joining us today via her 4G network. So you will see her via video, and, but we'll be running her slides for her. So please bear with us as we accommodate, um, accommodate this. So today's session, it's actually a fantastic one to kick off Data Week because it's going to provide you with a broader view of good data practices with more specific topics or issues being raised in the webinars over the next four days. So without further ado, Georgie, if you prepare yourself, uh, we shall begin with Georgie's talk. And again, please remember to post any questions that you have in the chat. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Let's uh, hope this works. Can you see the slides okay? Yes, I can. I was going to say, I can't see your faces now, so don't put a thumbs up. Say something brilliant. Thank you. Yes, I can. Sasha. Okay, cool. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for organising this, and thanks for inviting me. It's great to be part of something. It's great to see so many people join, which is fantastic, and, and beyond Cambridge as well, as I understand. So, um, as Sasha said, I'm, I'm in a small team called Open Research at Wellcome, and um, I'm going to just briefly introduce Wellcome for those that are not familiar with us and our, and our commitment around um, open science and open sharing and what we've done in that space already. Um, and then I want to take you through a couple of examples of where I think we are in terms of the landscape of data sharing currently, and specifically my examples around data availability statements, along with um, papers, and, uh, and a brief example on databases, which I think is an area um, which has been a bit of a gap as well in the past. Of course, there's always more that funders can do, and we get told that quite a lot, so um, I'll acknowledge there's, there's still challenges remaining. Um, and, and think about what we can do. And then finally, the question um, posed today for us uh, on, on winners and losers of data management practices. So as I said, for those that don't know, Welcome is a global charitable foundation. Um, we uh, give out about a billion uh, UK pounds a year at the moment um, to solve urgent health challenges facing everyone. This is our new vision and strategy, which has only just launched a few weeks ago. So for those that want to learn a bit more, it's an evolving space at the moment at Welcome. And, uh, and you can look at our website for more details on where we'll be focusing resources more in the future. Um, Georgie, he, yes. Georgie, can I just interrupt? It's, your, not um, it's, it's not going forward through the slides, so you need to set it up for a slideshow. Yeah, I thought I did. Um, I don't know, maybe. Maybe it won't go on if I'm set in that mode. You just move forward to, oh, there's something's happening. Let's see, does that make any difference? No. Okay, maybe I'm gonna go back to, can you see it there on the screen? I know that's not very good, but maybe at least we can. And we can see it on progress. the screen. I think that's fine. Okay, um, so, um, <laughs> Yes, I think key to all of Wellcome's work is our commitment on research culture. We've, we've talked quite a lot about recently, um, and that includes things like approaches to open research um, and making sure that the outputs of everything that we fund are um, available to the maximum number of people to maximise benefit and, of course, increase reproducibility and trustworthiness. Um, so that's at the core of, of what we're committed to. The question is always, 
how you realize that commitment and how you actually enable researchers to move whilst also making sure there's reward and recognition and so on. Um, I think it's clear that anyone who follows Welcome will know that we, we have a passionate champion and advocate for open access and data sharing. We were the first funder to have an open access policy in place many years ago, uh, but we also have lots of policies around um, sharing of outputs, uh, including data, software, materials and so on. And in fact, increased expectations when the research that we fund is um, to do with a public health emergency which brings me on to the COVID-19 example. Um, we had a specific statement which we released at the beginning of um, this year, the end of January, um, about expectations that we had um, on sharing of research findings um, related to COVID. But we also called on lots of other organisations to sign up to these kind of principles too. And that was relatively successful. We've got over 150 organisations, mostly publishers and funders, um, but we also called directly, as it were, to researchers to say, if you're working on COVID-19, please basically share uh, as quickly as possible and as widely as possible. And that certainly meant pre-publication. So really shifting behaviour from what we, we normally um, see. And it's worth saying that um, we are looking at um, gathering evidence on the impact of this statement and that's not yet been done we're coming up to one year on from that statement and seeing what actual change it might have instigated but what we can look at already is um, data availability statements um, and what i've done here and you can all look at the slides afterwards they'll, they'll be shared um, and i've put the links into the query that i've pulled from europe pmc so you can um, have a look at the updated data and see what i actually did i pulled um, full text research articles from Europe PMC from this year that are tagged as related to COVID-19 and you get just over 66,000 of those currently well this was data last week um, and I think what's I hope everyone would agree is, is less than overwhelming is that nine percent of them have any kind of data availability statement so um, it doesn't look like um, a lot of COVID papers have even a statement about their underlying data that's available. Now, it may be that the data is all presented within the paper, and that might be one explanation for why that's low. Um, but it's not super encouraging that there's nothing in that box at all. And I think what's really um, interesting is if you just look at all publications that were from this year back to 2020, the same time period, um, including COVID and non-COVID, 23% uh, have data availability statements. So it does, um, it does look less encouraging that there's been some mass shift in behaviour when you're working on COVID that you feel that you share the data more readily. But there may be a whole load of questions that need to be looked at there. Um, and finally, for sort of completeness, for those that don't know, Welcome has its own um, publishing platform called Wo Welcome Open Research. It's a completely open process of open peer review and so on. Um, and in the small numbers that we have there that are COVID related papers, we have a, a better success rate on at least data availability statements there. Uh, and why do we care about data availability statements? Well, um, I hope that most people will know this story, uh, although it's not necessarily an encouraging one, of, of the paper in The Lancet um, earlier this year, um, published with Surgisphere, where there were real question marks about the underlying data and how reliable it was, and subsequently the paper was then retracted. And it was after this experience that the Lancet then um, changed their policy and practices so that they have a higher expectation about data availability statements and also author's commitment to having seen the underlying data and so on. Um, so that's great. It's resulted in a shift. Um, is that only specific to you know, certain types of publications or will that be a long term situation? Um, we're, we're yet to see um, if this is like long term shifts in behaviour and expectations. Um, but I definitely don't want to paint a glass half um, empty picture. There are a lot of COVID data available already. And there have been some fantastic examples of real collaboration and open approaches um, to do with this pandemic. And it, this is just a tiny sample of, I think now, a hundred plus um, repositories, databases, portals to do with COVID data and accessing it. So there's some really good examples. On here on the left, you've got um, thousands now of viral isolate sequences available on that um, EMBL EBI data portal for COVID. 
Um, and on the right there, Vivli is an example of already we've got some clinical trial data sets available through a kind of managed access route um, that you can get access to now from COVID clinical trial um, data sets. Um, so I think some good news, um, but still some way to go. And then the other example I just wanted to briefly touch on is um, research databases, because I think this is an area um, which is also a bit um, underrepresented uh, in terms of our thoughts and support. Um, this was a paper that came out earlier this year in BMJ Open, and the authors basically looked at uh, over 350 research databases that had been created after January 2018. And they wrote to, they contacted each database and tried to assess how much the data held in those databases had been accessed and subsequent secondary publications that had resulted from that access. And again, a less than overwhelming, I think 34% of the databases they got in touch with had actually granted any access to their data and produced secondary publications. So I wrote to one of the authors, Simon Colstow, and asked him what he thought um, after having done all this effort, uh, funders like Wellcome could really do to, to change this situation. And he uh, clearly told me, those are his quotes at the bottom, that um, basically we need to commit to long-term support for maintaining databases. And I think um, we obviously, it's unfeasible to maintain hundreds and hundreds of databases. I think we need to think about core infrastructure uh, that can be sustained in the long term, that grantees can all be pointed to, and that we know it's going to be secure there for the long for a long time. So that brings me to what funders can do. As always, there's no single answer which is going to shift and solve this for everyone. I do think there's a place for um, policies and mandates and making sure that everyone is clear what the expectations are from the funder who's who's provided the funding for for research projects that requiring things like outputs management plans, as we call them at, at Wellcome, which is required for every application through Wellcome now, or data sharing plans with other organisations. Um, they're embedded as part of the standard process for what people, um, uh, as people apply for funding. Um, and, but also that the funders committing to support the costs associated with those data sharing plans. So, you know, there will be costs, we all know that, um, and the funder should be covering those. I mean, interestingly for us, uh, not many people cite costs in those output management plans. Um, and so um, just encouraging people to think about what it might cost them and, and, and put that in the budget up front. Again, coming back to the database question, I think major funding for kind of core infrastructure tools, resources that enable data sharing to happen um, is what we need to look at. Welcome uh, certainly um, actively participates in lots of cross-funder discussions. And I think it's much easier for researchers if there's a coordinated approach and the different funders at least agree on the underlying principles in all of this um, and the key expectations. So I think um, we do work on that. And then also um, looking to DORA, which for those that don't know is the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, to really encourage and, uh, and put pressure on institutions to say, you've got to genuinely shift from looking at where an article is published, where research is published, as opposed to the real content of it and its ultimate impact and other kind of measures of impact uh, than just um, the location of where research gets published in terms of rewarding researchers and career progression. Uh, there's definitely more to be done in that area. Finally, I just got to drop in FAIR for those that don't know it already. Um, we are spending a lot of time in cross-funder groups thinking about how we can make sure we're assessing research outputs as findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So there's a lot of um, development work active on this um, idea of FAIR data and FAIR outputs in general. Um, and then I will just end, obviously, I've got my email up there. Always welcome to have conversations with people. So do please follow up um, if you've got ideas or you want to know about other funding opportunities that we have from, from the Open Research team, do contact me. But my answer to the question of who are the winners and losers, ultimately, I genuinely believe that in the long term, everyone will be a winner from this. 
it's 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 clear to me that having produced research myself that if you spend that bit of time making sure it's well documented it's well organized it's got dictionaries it's uh, it's stored somewhere for the long term it will benefit you just as much as anyone else um, but in the short term i will acknowledge that there may be people that find um, being a champion in this field of which there are many um, will be a challenge for them individually and uh, and it's just about keeping going on this journey and getting to the point where everything is in place to truly reward and recognize those that um, that have good open practices and good data management practices. So thanks very much. I'll hand over to um, Catriona, which hopefully will work smoothly with the tech and then looking forward to discussion afterwards as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Georgie. And that's a lovely way to end, to end your presentation. Thank you. Um, okay, so we'll move on to Katrina now. So, Bea, please could you bring up uh, Katrina's um, presentation, please? And Katrina, please make sure you're unmuted. I think I'm unmuted. Is that, you are unmuted. Does that work? Yes. yes, you're good to go. So, if you just pop okay. Bea where you want the next slide to go. That's great, thank you. And um, apologies to the audience because I'm looking at my phone, which is very, very small, and um, someone wants to, someone's arrived at the door, but I can't answer them. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, but I will look to the side to look at my slides. Um, um, so um, uh, apologies for that. So uh, there, uh, next slide, please. So this is just very briefly. Um, I've been at uh, Hendawi since 2017. I was at PLOS before then so from 2003. Um, and Hendawi is a, a publisher of science, technology and medicine. There's about 20,000 peer reviewed articles a year. Um, and they're all open access, there's no embargoes, um, and they have a liberal license. But we are more than that because we also believe very much in um, open source and open infrastructure. Um, and actually open metadata, which I'll come to uh, later. Next slide, please. So the value, the value of data. So this is, uh, I agree with Georgie. So ultimately, I think there's so many winners, but this is, you know, there's, there's some obvious data, um, for example, from the Human Genome Project. And this was a study that was done back in about 2012, I think, uh, it's, it's, uh, the link is there which showed, you know, you can get an economic, the Human Genome Project um, alone, uh, it cost an investment of 3.8 million, but it helped drive $796 billion uh, and uh, 244 in total um, uh, personal income, income. It increased the number of jobs hugely. Um, and there's lots, that study is a little bit controversial, but I think no one doubts that um, when you share data and it's available for scientists to mine, um, then uh, it, it can make a huge economic difference. But there's also a massive societal benefit, I think. Um, one of the things which uh, Georgie has touched on um, is data increases trust. If the data is not available with your paper, um, um, then there is a, there's potentially a problem if it cannot be validated or, or, or reproduced. Um, and most obviously, we've seen this um, with public health, um, the advantage of sharing um, data um, and outputs and, you know, even papers as rapidly um, as possible. Um, and but I think there's, there's a larger thing, and I'll speak this, to this in the next slide as well. Um, but really, you know, when we think about the sustainable development goals and the target is 2030, when you look at the 17 sustainable development goals, there is not one that would not benefit from speeding up the science behind it. And by science, I mean all subject areas. We've got politics in there, um, societal needs, cultural needs. All of these will benefit from uh, sharing data in the same way as public health. And I, I think it would be a, an enormous mistake if we prevented other disciplines from having the same opportunity um, as, as the biomedical. And, and people often see the, that data sharing has been driven uh, by the biomedical community. But I think the um, importance to every single subject area is, is the same. Um, and there is uh, evidence that it speeds up innovation. But again, we can look at COVID, but there's also um, issues around um, 
increasing the integrity and rigor and accountability of work that is out there. Um, next slide, please. And just to sort of hammer the point home a bit, um, this was a, a study done uh, this, this year by um, Alia, which is the All um, European Academies. And they, uh, uh, this is just pointing out why it's as relevant to um, the um, humanities and social sciences. And there's a quote uh, from that document. In the humanities, we all use research data, although we may not be aware of it. It is like in the case of Monsieur Jourdain, the title character of Molière's Le Bourgeois Gentillon, who learnt to his great satisfaction that unwittingly he had been speaking prose all his life. With research data in the humanities, it is exactly the same. You are using it, even if you don't know it. And once you realize it, it will affect your research workflow forever. And it is different, and it? it is different than the, the, the biomedical sciences, because a lot of the data um, is also about interpretation. Um, but there is no reason that there can't be ways of sharing these data reliably um, with others in the field and, and with the general public. And in the middle of the slide is a, is a host of sort of different types of objects that could potentially be shared, but the, um, the document's really uh, worth reading. So what do we have a problem with? And this is, this is a, a, a a sort of older study now, I think it's 2014, but this is the basic problem, is that the probability, well, there's two problems, the probability of finding a data associated with a paper, even if it's there, declines by 17% every year, so it's not in repositories. Um, oh, next, oh, sorry, next slide, please. <laughs> That's that one. Um, but it's also not about and these um, this was actually within a, a field where they were generally comfortable with sharing data in in, in 2014. Um, next slide please. But there's a larger problem about not having access to data and, and scientists themselves. Um, this is this is a, a study um, again it's published recently uh, this year in PLOS One by Carol uh, Tenapier and others. Um, so how much do you agree with this statement? And more, almost 75% of scientists uh, surveyed in this report said lack of access to data generated by other researchers or institutions is a major impediment to progress in science. Lack of access to data generated by other researchers or institutions has restricted my ability to answer scientific questions. And then, you know, there are issues that, you know, the data may be misinterpreted due to the complexity of data and the quality of the data, or may be used in ways that is not intended. And, and there do need to be safeguards around how data are shared and what's made available. Just putting data out there um, in a data dump is not appropriate. Um, they need to be in um, secure repositories. And by secure, I mean repositories with good uh, standards um, in order that they can be reused and shared. Um, and as Georgie was talking about, you know, there are there are databases out there where there is no access to data, even though they actually are uh, well curated. And so there's, there is a fundamental problem with supporting the infrastructure for data in this area. But there's no doubt that not having data is a problem for science. And so next slide, please. Next slide. Ah, COVID. Okay. So this is coming back to the COVID. So I think in some ways COVID has been uh, um, uh, a bless uh, a blessing in a way at one level, in that it has shown us just from this point of view, it has shown us the power of open access and open data. However, it's also exposed systemic flaws within the existing system. So next slide, please. Um, and this, you know, one of, one of the things is that, as uh, Georgie talked about, there was a, a, um, a statement that Welcome and, and Who and others 
all um, signed signed up to asking for COVID preprints and COVID data to be shared immediately, and publishers rushed to make COVID uh, um, publications open access and freely available for everyone because of the health pandemic. But as uh, Vincent uh, Lavier from the University of Montreal said, they say we're opening everything because it's important that we advance things fast. Well, the flip side of this argument is that your normal behaviour is to put barriers to science. And in this, in some ways, COVID has been, uh, and this, the, the journalist writing this article said it was a temporary glimpse of a world where science is openly shared. But the measures also raise questions about the way science as usual is practised. And that is basically a tacit omission that business as usual in research slows down science. Now, and here I'm, 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 I'm not pointing the figure, finger at any one sort of actor in particular. I think everyone, everyone has a role to play in this. So publishers have a huge role to play in this. Funders do and institutions do. Um, and um, this is a problem that we can only actually solve through collaboration. Um, Georgie showed the search sphere data case. And um, uh, so I, I won't, I won't uh, dwell on this, but, you know, one, again, this speaks to the fundamental flaws in the system. One of the questions raised by the publication of the Sergio paper was how the paper passed peer review process. So we have a peer review process, which is meant to check the quality and the impact and the integrity of work. And yet this paper got through and there was the you know, the data were deeply questionable and, and they couldn't be shared. And so I think it, it shines a spotlight on absolutely everything um, that we're doing and whether it actually works uh, within the digital age that we're, uh, we're inhabiting. This is uh, back to the uh, Tenepier article, um, and this was actually asking researchers in different disciplines so that they, they didn't, uh, uh, weren't looking um, really at the humanities in this. I would be willing to share data across a broad group of researchers. So lots of researchers say they're willing to share data and they would like to. When push comes to shelf, however, there's a, a paper on the side here that says actually, uh, no, when, when they, they're, they're asked to share data, they won't. Um, and and the, the, there is this tension. It's like researchers wear two hats. There's, there's data that they would like to have access to, and then there's their data. Um, and, you know, if all, all or part of your data, sorry, next slide, please. Um, this is from the same um, article and, 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 you know, so why won't you publish and uh, uh, why won't you make your data available? And they say, well, I'm, you know, I need to publish first, which is, is understandable. Um, there's also other issues, which again, Georgia has talked about, um, it's about resources and, 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 and time and lack of funding and lack of standards. Um, some researchers don't think uh, anyone else needs the data. Um, and, um, um, you know, not everyone has the, the skills to make data available. So there's a, there's a deep problem uh, within the sort of entire system about uh, not just the willingness to share data, and I think that there would be more willingness, but um, also the um, feasibility of actually sharing your data. Um, and this um, um, is another uh, survey. This is from the European University Association. So this speaks to the role, uh, role of, of um, institutions as well. And so institutions were asked, um, what was the importance of, uh, of different types of academic activities for their research careers. And at the very top, and it's very, very stark, at the very top is research publications, and at the very bottom is open science and open access. And open science, of course, includes sharing data. Uh, next slide, please. And then when institutions <clears throat> all across Europe are asked, uh, you know, how you evaluate um, your, your researchers? Well, it's mainly metrics measuring research output based on the number of publications and citations. And things like open science and open access and uh, the open accessibility of research outcomes and data is way much, much lower down. Next slide, please. And um, uh, the actual metrics that are used for research careers are, of course, uh, uh, the most prominent one, and these are this is data from institutions across Europe are the, are the journal impact factor. 
And so they, they conclude that the survey results indicate a stark divide between the research assessment practices that universities consider important and those that they consider unimportant, and open science and, access, uh, and open science access indicators are considered of little importance or outright unimportant. So, you know, the problem is everywhere in the system. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to have to speed up rapidly. I know we're running a bit late, but I think I'm <clears throat> going. This is uh, a from October 2020. So this is a, a UK specific slide. It's from the um, Minister for Science, Research and Innovation in the UK, who's responsible for all research. And these are just a selection of quotes and I'm not gonna read them all out. But this is what the UK minister is saying. Researchers tell me they feel pressure to publish in particular venues in order to gain the respect of their peers, which wrongly suggests that where you publish something is more important than what you say. That just can't be right. Or people talk to me about refable publications. The REF in the UK is, is um, the system by which researchers and institutions, institutions get evaluated. Um, and this is a, uh, a refable publications, which is a total distortion of the value of research and a constraint on the diversity of research objects. And the REF, um, um, oh yeah, and another one, despite the rich variety of outputs that can come from research, over 97% of outputs submitted to the UK uh, sort of research evaluation exercise, um, the last time it happened, was text-based. And just think about that, even though so much of the value of science and both the humanities um, and, uh, and social sciences, as well as, uh, as the, the life sciences and physical sciences, have so many other outputs in addition publications. Um, I'm not going to read out more, but there's the, those are great quotes. Um, the next slide, please. A couple of minutes, Katrina. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll probably take about three. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the, um, um, Georgie has mentioned some of these before. There are now lots of in initiatives to try and get organizations, fundings, publishers, researchers to stop thinking about publications as um, the, the way to measure research. Um, next slide, please. And in fact, as we speak, there's a conference with the Global Research Council that goes on this week and you can sign up and register it, um, which is uh, about responsible research assessment. And I think this is at the, 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 the crux of everything that we're talking about. Um, and um, um, the, uh, there's, a, there's the UKRI, the funder, um, um, from the from the UK that is is, is um, helping to organise this, um, but they point out the the role of funders. There is now renewed urgency for funders to come together and reconsider how research is assessed and evaluated. Next slide, play, please. And here I'm just going to go off at what you might think is a tangent for one minute, <laughs> but it's not. But I want to say, what does makes open science transformative. And next slide, please. And it's the infrastructure. Uh, next slide, the one with trains. Um, and it's not just, uh, 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 and it's open infrastructure. So when you think about why there has been such a revolution in the way we can communicate science, and, and uh, no, sorry, the previous slide, please. Um, go back to the trains. <laughs> Um, are you there? The, the, uh, the reason is because of the digital infrastructure we have that enables us to share, collaborate, access, discover. And um, this is incredibly important as well. Your data is important, but also your data about your data and your data about every single other outputs and how that is put together. There are even some journals nowadays uh, which do not have an online um, counterpart. They're still in print. This is like getting on a train and then uh, without realizing there are no tracks to take you anywhere. Um, and we're also dealing with a system where, in a way, publishing and the, the old system is, is still um, a steam train. 
And yet the possibilities that we have are much, much greater than that. But we're still living in a sort of steam age technology and funded world. Um, next slide, please. Um, and Georgie has already mentioned FAIR, um, and this is very important. Um, I wanted to flag CARE as well, because we also have a duty to pay attention to the power issues around how we share data. I'm not going to go into that, but we can talk about it later. Um, and But part of FAIR data is reusable and interoperable and findable. Next slide, please. And I'm going to end my talk on two slides. So this slide, and I'm not going to talk much about it, but it's really, really important that everyone in the system, including researchers, is aware of the impact of not having the appropriate infrastructure describing your work. These are things like persistent identifiers, such as DOIs for articles, but also it's the metadata. It's the data about the data how that data is described um, and these data um, and how it's described can have different standards and different field but the metadata comes as part of the the persistent identifier such as the doi it's attached with it and it's like communicating in uh, a language that allows you to describe what that object um, what that data was dealing with next slide please and one of the outcomes of this means that data sets can be cited. Um, and um, without that digital infrastructure, data sets will never be important until they can start to be valued as separate entities on their own. And I'm sure you'll hear about data availability statements and data citations, but there's, there's one piece of evidence at the moment that those publications that do have data availability statements um, that include a link to, to a data set are up to 25% more likely to uh, be cited, be cited 25% more than other articles. The data is small, um, but that's a start. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there. My final slide is about the responsibility of publishers, but um, we can talk about that um, um, during the discussion if you would like to. Thank you. Oh, I can't hear, Georgie. Uh, I, I, sorry, Sasha, I can't hear it's you. It's okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, excellent messages there. And I'm really pleased you mentioned metadata at the end and the importance of it, because really without that, we're kind of going a bit blind uh, when it comes to reusing other people's data sets or even sharing our own, understanding our own reshare. Um, so we've got some really interesting questions that have come through on the chat. So perhaps both Katrina and Georgie, if you could just unmute yourself so that you're ready to speak as and when. Uh, so the first one I'm gonna start with is going backwards a little bit. And I think this is a really interesting question. So somebody has asked that in countries without REF, so the REF is something that's specific to the UK. So in countries without REF, is data sharing better? That's a really interesting question. Mm. Um, and I don't think we know the answers, but I think in every country um, that I'm aware of, whether you're from China or from India or uh, one of the um, African countries or Middle Eastern countries or South American countries, everyone puts too much focus on the publications uh, and often the impact factor. And this is an inherent disincentive to sharing data because you want to be able to hold on to your data to get as many publications as possible. Um, so I think this is a, a systemic problem uh, throughout the world. I think there's a there's a, an issue about uh, um, sharing data. I think um, the African Academy of Sciences are now gathering to, <clears throat> together are, are um, hugely strong proponents of open access and open data. Um, but they quite rightly also want their own expertise and um, recognition of the data in their countries. And there, there is a sense in many parts of the world that um, Europe um, and the US um, and other high middle income countries um, are basically 
uh, it's almost like scientific colonialism, taking taking the data from from elsewhere and then <clears throat> getting the publications and um, 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 about those data. And, and so I think that I, I want to point to issues that, that that complex issues around equity here and and how we respect um, the value of data in different contexts and in different regions of the world. Uh, I think there's a problem sharing data throughout the world is the bottom line. I think. It's really interesting that you have that um, opinion from from a publisher's perspective. So, so Georgie, I'd ask you the same thing from a funder's perspective, the provider of money for research. What do you think of of that? This question. I mean, I, I echo Katrina. I don't think uh, I know of good data and evidence to to answer that question. So um, I'm not sure. I think what is interesting about Ref, though, is um, my understanding is that Ref for some time have um, been cognizant of this issue and have built in the ability, certainly within the questions that are asked and the forms that are filled in, for a whole range of research outputs to be cited and actually encourage institutions and researchers to cite them. And there is still a persistence in those not being cited. So in a sense, the REF isn't necessarily the problem in the same way that um, uh, that Welcome has in our end of grant reporting a whole set of different sections that say what outputs did you um, resulted from from the, your research, uh, impacts on policy, software, materials, biosamples, databases, all sorts of things. And very rarely is there much filled in. There are, you know, champions that fill in lots and then there are lots of grantees that don't fill in much at all. So it's almost like we needed to, as Katrina alluded to, we need to build the infrastructure and the system. So that, and that has taken time. So those forms have changed, the questions that are asked are changed, but it almost seems like behavior isn't keeping up with, with, the, with the infrastructure in some cases. Um, and I also would just um, add that there's, there's often this sort of rhetoric of, um, there'll be, there'll be uh, losers in, poorer resource settings. And what I've seen from um, experience in clinical trial data sharing, which is an area I spend a lot of time on, is that there are some fantastic examples of uh, leadership in data sharing based in our Africa Asia program. So I've seen some brilliant systems developed in our Ken, in, in the Welcome Ken, Kemri unit and the same in Thailand, uh, which I would suggest are a lot further ahead than some of the UK um, based researchers. So there's not an obvious kind of, oh, well, you know, if you're working in a low income country, you know, you're, you're resistant to this more than you are somewhere else. It's not, it's not uh, such a clear picture. And um, again, a lot of the time it comes down to leadership and just some champions who, who feel like they really want to, to push this agenda. Um, yeah, mm. that's, that's where I okay. I've, I get the feeling that this is a topic that would make a webinar on its own right to sort of dig into this a little deeper. Um, so I'm going to move on to another question. So I, I think this is, makes a really interesting point. So somebody has asked that they wonder how to get qualitative researchers on board with this. Um, so they've said uh, the more important question is how to address the difference in research paradigm that underpins the research practice. So where reproducibility and replicability are part of STEM subjects, but this doesn't necessarily translate over into the humanities and social sciences. So uh, what, what, what comments do you have about this? So I'll, I'll go, I, you, you both look like you're itching to, to speak, but I'll go Katrina first, because she looks more itching to speak <laughs> about this one. Okay, so um, I, I think there is uh, no difference. I think qualitative data is data, our data. Um, and um, there, there, there's, a, there's a professor in Amsterdam called Rick Peel, who's a professor of philosophy. And he's argued that reproducibility is just as um, valid for the humanities and social sciences as anyone else. And it's the way that you have to think about it. But I think, and also when you think about it, social scientists and, uh, and others are probably best placed 
to actually define what rigor, integrity, validity, the reproducibility or replicability, the words themselves are so loaded um, that you shouldn't just take the sort of uh, out of the box reproducibility standards for a medical paper and apply it to social sciences or the humanities or qualitative data. That has to be worked, but, but uh, I suppose there hasn't been the pressure to look at it in the same way as there has been on the medical sciences when there have been so many concerns about um, fraudulent papers, retracted papers and lack of data and things. And we're just at different stages for different disciplines. Um, but um, uh, I think I think it's absolutely as relevant and as important. Um, and we need more work on, on what that looks like in different disciplines. Excellent. Georgie, do you have anything to add or do you want me to move on to another question? Yeah, I don't I don't think so. Um, I, I think um, Katrina said, yeah, all the good points. OK, in that case, I have a question actually that's specifically I have two actually that's specific specifically directed at you so the first one's perhaps a rather quick one to answer and somebody's asked what do you mean by research databases yes um i was meaning i guess uh, repositories is another word that might be more familiar for people so places where um multiple data sets or data or you know large data sets from particular projects uh have been um developed and established and usually those databases have some sort of portal or front facing a repository has some access mechanism it could be that they're just downloadable files that somebody can immediately click through a website um, but more often than not there's some sort of controlled access of varying levels appropriate to the content of the data um, and so yeah in my example that i cited that piece of evidence was was um about uh databases that had a sort of managed access route so, so you had to apply to get access to the data and then they could track the users and so on. Okay, okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so there's another question for you, Georgie, and um, that is, what are your expectations from the FAIR, for the FAIR checking tool to be developed with Rory? So the, I don't know if I've pronounced that correct, but the yeah. Research on Research Institute. Yes. Okay. Is there a plan um, for deploying it um, or monitoring it within Welcome? Yeah, um, so for those that aren't familiar with this, somebody's well informed, which is good. Um, this is a very early stage, actually. So we have a cross funder group, um, uh, which I think is a good way to go with this, uh, to uh, commission um, developers to build um, essentially a piece of software, which is being called Fairware. There's an enormous number of, um, of different variations on fair something <laughs> that have emerged over the last few years, but this is Fairware. Uh, with the idea that it could be somewhat automated um, to assessing the fairness. So almost like giving a, a fair score to different outputs, particularly data is the idea. And those um, that will be based on a set of, you know, agreed criteria, things like, as Katrina said, um, needing to have a persistent identifier, having a working URL, having good metadata of a minimum set of standards, things like that, that would uh, that would define a data output as fair. Um, ultimately, so this is, as I say, at the very early stage, we've, we've got some uh, expressions of interest and, uh, and, um, and looking to uh, appoint uh, a contractor, which hasn't been done yet. So, and then they will obviously need time to actually build this tool. So um, it's not even been built yet, uh, but it's, uh, it's definitely with a view that it would be useful for the researchers themselves to be able to go online and run their research output through this tool that will tell them how fair it is and where maybe there's some missing gaps uh, and ultimately um, for funders to be able to use uh, to be able to to check outputs yeah from particular projects and see where there are improvements to be made so yeah that, that's the idea as I say um, not even built yet but hopefully will be useful um to to all concerned yeah okay so you you heard it here first <laughs> quickly katrina did you want to add something or well ju just actually i think um to talk about the research on research institute because that's mm. an initiative um and welcome one of the funders which is trying to look at the sort of uh evidence base around 
scholarly communication and policies around uh, um, funder policies um, and to actually provide an evidence base for what works and what doesn't work. And that itself um, being applied to the sort of discipline of scholarly communication, you like, is, is, is relatively new and it's actually new within the sciences. <clears throat> and it has been done within the social sciences and humanities. Um, but there's, there's, when you think about all of the processes that we have around publication, around sharing data, um, even around data repositories, uh, we have very little information on 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 what works, and we're, um, we're 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 sort of wedded to this system that was sort of developed in uh, well early in the sort of seventeenth century at one level, but let's say the twentieth century, and we're dealing uh, and yet we're dealing with a completely different uh, world. Um, and finding out what works and what doesn't for every part of the scholarly workflow and for research assessment and researcher evaluation um, itself is, is really important. So that's, that's the only point I would make. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose one last question before we go to the, the poll. So this is quite a broad question. It's quite an open question. This was posed by one of the people who registered sort of in advance. And the question is, what is the role of universities in the so-called data-driven economy? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a, it's a massive Good question. question. Yeah. yeah. The, there's um, there's um, someone at uh, Stanford called Julia Lane who looks, uh, Professor Julia Lane, who looks at the economic impact of institutions and the role of data and metadata. Um, the, I think it's, uh, uh, it's hugely important for two reasons. I think institutions in a way um, have a, a, a real opportunity to meet their mission and help drive local economic growth um, around the data. And this is not like just, I'm not talking about the data of researchers, but I'm talking about the the the, the sort of uh, data about researchers themselves as well. And it's actually, we have to be really careful that that data is not being monetized by commercial companies um, and others who are putting it behind barriers that can't be accessed. So um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. I, I, I don't think I, I know enough about that area, but um, I think I think it's a huge question, yeah. Okay. Georgie, do you have anything in like one minute to add in relation to that? Um, if not, we can just go in and like, think about it for a very, very long time, but sure. do you have anything you'd like that's to just, add? No, no, that's fine, we're pressed for time. But it is, it's a great question, and I'd love yeah. people to engage their own institutions in that. You know, why not? I mean, we don't have the institutions really represented today, but but why not spark that debate and, uh, and question your own institution, yeah. Yeah, I think that's really, really good food for thought, definitely. Okay, so we have, we have a poll. Um, uh, Dominic, are you happy to launch the poll? Yes. Um, so in this poll, we'd like you to vote. So the question you have, you can only pick one of these options. So the question is, um, which of the following is most likely to prevent or inhibit good data practices among researchers? Do so you have one single choice? So have, have a minute or so to think about it. And um, then we'll have a look at the results at the end. In hindsight, it would have been interesting to run this poll at the beginning and at the end of your talks to see if this, the, the responses were, that would be any different. We have 129 of you attending, so we're nearly, we're nearly there, nearly maxing out. Okay. 
Okay, Dominic, can you share the results and then hopefully everybody will be able to see them. Okay, interesting. Okay, that's very interesting, I think, um, that the most frequent response was that it's not embedded in research culture. Um, and I, I do happen to agree, actually. Um, um, I don't know if, if, if Georgie or Katrina want to comment on the results of this poll as well. Yeah, I think, I, well, I think that's great that um, yeah. people have been honest, actually, as well, because I think that is probably the honest answer that, um, you know, we often get issues of, oh, well, there's not funding there, or I don't know which repository to put it in. And, and a lot of that has been solved. And I think the much harder thing to solve, as we all know, is the, the culture, um, because there's so many parts to it that, you know, are, are not within any single organisation's control. Um, so I, I do think it's a real cultural issue and, and also accepting that to change culture takes time uh, if, if we're all committed to change it as well. You're, you're muted. You need to unmute. Katrina. Oh yes, sorry. Okay. Uh, I can I completely agree with with Georgie. Uh, and the the thing is 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 <clears throat> the hardest thing to change is culture, but it's culture in every at every level of the system, every part of the system. There are at the moment no incentives for anyone to change what they're doing, whether you're a publisher, an institution, a funder, a researcher, and and and, uh, and changing that. So that's why it has to be a really, there's no point just blaming fingers and saying, well, researchers won't share data or whatever. It has to be a real collaborative, collective action in order to try and, and change the system. And, and we absolutely do need the infrastructure and the funding there to help support that change. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, so it's it's essentially all hands to the deck. Okay, excellent. Well, I think this I I, I think uh, that's that's the challenge ahead of us, and I think this is a this is a theme that's going to pervade throughout the the next four webinars as part of Cambridge Data Week is, is research culture very much so. So um, it's one minute one minute past half past. If anyone's ever said that like that before, 31, 31 minutes past. Um, I would just really like to thank both speakers today for providing us with your insights and addressing some actually very difficult broad questions. Um, and thank you very much to all of the um, attendees today for joining us. Do sign up to the other webinars if you haven't done so already and if you can make them. And yes, I'd just like to say thank you um and enjoy the rest of your weeks everybody uh, and georgie may i just say thank you for inviting me as well i forgot to do it in my talk and thank you for everyone for coming too you're, you're welcome great thanks guys thanks for the thank team you. behind organizing this and enjoy the yes. rest of the week enjoy <laughs> the rest you. of the week it looks great <laughs>